During the recent years, scientists made two breakthrough discoveries about our universe. Thanks to new technologies, we've looked into the distant past. And we've learned something that can change our understanding of the universe forever. What are these discoveries and what do they mean to us? Let's find out. Recently, we unveiled the first color image from the James Webb Space Telescope. It's a mind-bending photo capturing thousands of ancient galaxies. This oldest documented light in the history of the universe dates back over 13 billion years. That's just 600 million years after the Big Bang. It's like getting a sneak peek into the universe's baby album. But that was just the beginning. Astronomers were expecting to see some tiny young galaxies. But what they found was a real surprise. Impossibly early, impossibly massive, and all that from just a tiny red dot. The lead author of the study, Ivo Lab, was working at the computer as usual. And suddenly he got two numbers. Age, 13 billion years. Weight, 100 billion stars. When he realized what that meant, he nearly spit out his coffee. But that red dot was just the beginning. The next day they found five more galaxies just like this. Turns out, these six massive galaxies are as old as the Milky Way itself. The entire research team was in disbelief. They were like, wait, what? These guys couldn't be that mature so early in time. Did we make a mistake? But nope. The James Webb Space Telescope, the new cool guy on the space block, just has some serious skills. It can see through dust clouds with its infrared vision and spot galaxies that were previously invisible. Move over Hubble. There's a new stargazer in town. But why is it shaking things up so much? Because this discovery affects our understanding of how galaxies formed. Let's try to explain. A long time ago, 13.8 billion years ago to be precise, our universe was born. It was chilling out for a while and then it started to form the first galaxies. And these galaxies were full of gas and dust. Eventually this gas started turning into stars. Some galaxies were more massive and had more stars. And some were lighter and had almost no stars at all. In any case, they all grew gradually. The stars in them were born slowly and smoothly. That's how our current models explain this. But these new observations from the James Webb Space Telescope show an unexpected surprise. Looks like, even in the early universe, our ancient friends had lots of stars. More than what we would ever expect. If that's the case, then these galaxies are like the overachievers of the universe. They skipped the small and gradual growth phase and went straight to being giant universe breakers. According to our current cosmological model, they shouldn't even exist. But they do, so... It looks like after the Big Bang, the stars were forming much faster than we thought. Which is pretty weird. This could mean that there's something missing in our understanding of the galaxy formation. As you can see, these universe breakers are really living up to their name causing a potential total consensus among scientists. The universe was like, hey, I'm about to flip cosmology models upside down. But let's not jump to conclusions. There are many theories that could explain these mind-boggling discoveries without breaking the standard model. For example, maybe the light we're seeing isn't coming from stars at all, but from the swirling disks of doom around supermassive black holes. These colossal cosmic beasts can gobble up matter and spit out a dazzling light show and James Webb Telescope's keen eye is picking up on these enigmatic accretion disks like never before. Or maybe these galaxies could be playing hide-and-seek with us. Maybe there's more to the story that we haven't seen yet. After all, the universe is vast and mysterious, and we've only just begun to scratch the surface. And whoa, 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 we really need to slow down here. Before we even try to explain all this stuff, we need to confirm whether these ancient galaxies really are that old. Although even if they're actually just supermassive black holes, it still shows an astounding change. We'll have to wait about a year to find out. One thing's for sure, the James Webb Space Telescope has definitely taught us a valuable lesson. Expect the unexpected. And this is just the beginning of unexpected. Evo Laba's team wasn't the only one who made such a huge breakthrough. There's also a team that claims that they've unlocked the secrets of the universe's past, and that's worth two Nobel Prizes. Move over, James Webb Space Telescope, because this discovery came from an antenna that's smaller than a fridge and costs less than $5 million. Talk about space bargain hunting! 
the astronomers caught this signal that showed some surprises. It was coming from the earliest stars of our universe, back in the days when they were just beginning to twinkle. Say hi to our celestial ancestors again. Now, the signal was pretty weird. The temperatures were unusually low, and there was a pronounced wave that left astronomers scratching their heads. What could be causing all this? Well, there's a theory. Dark matter may have been at work, and if that's the case, then we can really be on the verge of a great discovery. Imagine you're looking at the night sky filled with stars, but there's something else there that you can't see. It's like an invisible cloak that covers the entire universe. Scientists call this mysterious stuff dark matter. Dark matter is like the ghost of our world. It doesn't emit, absorb, or reflect any light. We can't see it with telescopes or our eyes. That's why we call it dark matter. But if we can't detect it in any way, how do we know it exists? Because of its gravitational pull. One day we noticed that our understanding of how galaxies were created was incorrect. According to our calculations, they should have been some chaotic gas. But something held them together, turning them into spirals like some kind of invisible glue. Then we thought, maybe this invisible glue really exists. If the moon was invisible, we would still suspect that it exists somewhere because its gravity affects the tides on Earth. This is also the case with dark matter. Its gravity influences the motion of galaxies and other cosmic objects. In fact, dark matter makes up a huge chunk of the universe, about 27% of it. Moreover, the normal matter we can see like stars, planets, and galaxies only make up about 5% of the universe. So even though we can't see dark matter, there's actually more of it in the universe than everything we can see. Scientists are still trying to figure out if dark matter exists and what it can be made of. Some theories suggest that it could be made up of exotic particles that are different from the particles that we're used to. Others think that it might be some kind of weird, undiscovered form of matter that doesn't interact with light at all. Anyway, it's an intriguing mystery, and if we ever confirm the existence of dark matter, our understanding of our world will change forever. So now you can understand why the excitement in the scientific community is palpable. If this discovery is confirmed, then we will get the first real proof of dark matter. This discovery may be even more important than the Big Bang itself because, as astronomers put it, we are made of star stuff, and so we are glimpsing at our origin. But of course, we still have to wait and explore all this in great detail. In science, one should never rush to conclusions. And while scientists study this stuff, we'll be here, on the edge of our seats waiting for the next space blockbuster to unfold. The universe never ceases to amaze us with its wonders. Who knew that such a small and humble antenna could unlock such cosmic secrets? It just goes to show that in the vastness of space, even the tiniest discoveries can have the biggest impact. Keep looking up, and who knows what other cosmic surprises are waiting to be uncovered. On August 20th, 1977, the most ambitious space mission took off from Earth. The main goal of Voyager 2 was to study the outer solar system up close. It became possible because of a rare alignment of planets. Voyager 2 was supposed to study all the gas giants of the solar system – Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune. Astronomers also hoped it would be able to find and explore the edge of the solar system. Since Voyager 2 was built for interstellar travel, the probe was equipped with a large 12-foot-wide antenna. It allowed the spaceship to send the data it gathered back to Earth. During its journey, the space probe discovered a 14th moon of Jupiter. Voyager 2 was the only spaceship to study all four giant planets from up close. It was the first human-made object to fly past Uranus, where it found two new rings and ten new moons. Voyager 2 also flew by Neptune and noticed its great dark spot. That's a colossal spinning storm in the planet's southern hemisphere. The storm is the size of Earth and moves at a speed of 1,500 miles per hour. These winds are the strongest ever recorded on any planet of the solar system. In the history of space exploration, only five spacecraft have managed to leave the gravitational pull of the solar system. Those were Pioneer 10 and 11, Voyager 1 and 2, and New Horizons. People launch thousands of objects into space. These objects easily overcome Earth's gravity. 
but the Sun is around 300,000 times as massive as our home planet. That's why its gravitational pull is way more difficult to find. Even more impressively, Voyager 2 is the second human-made object in history to reach the space between stars after passing through the heliosphere. That's a bubble of magnetic fields and particles produced by the Sun and protecting the solar system. Two years after its launch, Voyager 2 started transmitting the first images of Jupiter. The space probe provided scientists with much-needed information about Io and Europa, some of the largest of Jupiter's moons. Then the space mission passed by the gas giant itself. The distance between the spacecraft and the planet was around 400,000 miles. That's when the probe noticed some changes in the shape and color of the Great Red Spot. It's an enormous, long-lived storm system, like a hurricane on Earth, but much, much larger. Two years later, Voyager 2 reached Saturn. It discovered spokes and kinks in some of the planet's rings. While the spacecraft was flying behind and up past the gas giant, it passed through the plane of Saturn's rings. At that time, Voyager's speed was around 8 miles per second. For several minutes, the probe was hit by thousands of micron-sized grains of dust. This kept shifting the probe's direction, and its control jets had to fire many times to stabilize the vehicle. After Voyager 2 explored Uranus and Neptune, it headed out of the solar system. Its instruments were put in low power to save energy. In August 2007, the spacecraft passed the terminal shock. It's the boundary marking the outer limit of the sun's influence. Here, the solar wind slows down. In the summer of 2013, the probe reached interstellar space. Now, when it comes to sending and receiving signals in space, there are three factors you should keep in mind – distance, power, and time. The farther away a spacecraft is, the farther a signal has to travel before it reaches it, and the longer it takes for this signal to catch up with the spacecraft. And when it finally gets there, it's extremely weak. Another problem is that once the spacecraft is launched, it can't be upgraded it's literally stuck with the technology it was outfitted with. Plus, such spaceships as Voyager 2 are powered by radioactive fuel. When special material radioactively decays, it releases heat that gets converted into electricity. Unfortunately, the more material decays away, the less power the spacecraft has for receiving and transmitting radio signals. Despite this issue, we haven't lost the connection with Voyager 1 and 2. That's because new and more powerful technologies appear on Earth. Signals people send can reach much farther than before. That's why it was possible to stay in touch with Voyager 2, which entered interstellar space in 2018 and has already traveled almost 12 billion miles away from Earth. But in March 2020, the main piece of equipment that allowed scientists to exchange signals with the spaceship was switched off. After the communication with the spacecraft stopped, NASA spent around 11 months upgrading its deep space network and installing new hardware. The DSN is an international array of huge radio antennas that help astronomers on Earth communicate with interplanetary missions. These antennas are located in California, Madrid, and Canberra. The one used to keep in touch with Voyager 2 is a 230-foot wide dish in Canberra. This is the only equipment that can send commands that can reach the probe. This antenna, known as DSS-43, started operating in 1972, five years before Voyager 2 and 1 were launched. At that time, it was only 210 feet across. Since then, the dish has received a lot of repairs and upgrades. But these 11 months were the longest the antenna was offline. In October 2020, the antenna was finally ready for a trial after all the upgrades and repairs. The mission operator sent a set of commands to Voyager 2. And after many months of radio silence, the spacecraft returned the signal. The probe confirmed it had heard the call. After that, the spacecraft carried out the commands. While the dish was offline, the mission operators could actually receive scientific data and health updates from Voyager 2. Astronomers kept getting data from interstellar space, the region outside the Sun's heliosphere. But they couldn't send any commands to the probe, since it had traveled too far away from Earth. The upgraded antenna received two new radio transmitters, and it was done just in time. One of the transmitters, that was used to communicate with Voyager 2, hadn't been replaced in almost 50 years. The antenna also got new cooling and heating equipment and other electronics necessary to support the advanced transmitters. Now, a curious thing about the Deep Space Network 
is that its radio antennas are positioned in a very precise way. They're spaced equally around the globe. This way, almost any spacecraft can stay in touch with at least one facility at all times. But Voyager 2 is an exception. In 1989, it made a close flyby of Triton, Neptune's moon. It was the only close encounter people had with the eighth planet of the solar system and its moon. By the way, Triton is the largest known object that is believed to be born in the Kuiper Belt. That's a donut-shaped ring around the sun full of icy objects. Voyager 2 discovered Neptune's ring system and its tiny inner moons. The probe also gathered a lot of amazing information about Triton. For example, it became clear that the moon is covered in cryovolcanoes. Instead of spewing molten rock, these volcanoes spit ice consisting of water, ammonia, and methane. When the New Horizons spacecraft flew past Pluto more than 25 years later, it discovered the same phenomenon on the dwarf planet. Anyway, to make this detour, Voyager 2 had to travel over the gas giant's North Pole. But this changed the probe's trajectory, deflecting it southward relative to the planes of the planets. Since then, Voyager 2 has been moving in that direction. And now, the spacecraft is so far away that it's out of reach of the radio antennas in the Northern Hemisphere, those in Madrid and California. This makes DSS-43, which is located in the Southern Hemisphere, the only dish powerful enough in broadcasting just the right frequency to send commands to Voyager 2. Voyager 1, the probe's faster-traveling twin, didn't change its trajectory. After passing by Saturn, it took a different path. That's why now it can easily communicate with the two facilities in the Northern Hemisphere. The upgrade the Canberra Deep Space Communication Complex has gone through can also benefit other space missions. For example, the Mars Perseverance rover that landed on the Red Planet on February 18, 2021. The dish will also be crucial for exploring other planets and the Moon. You're flying through space, dodging stars and black holes. Your speed is so great that you can get from one galaxy to another in just a few minutes. Sound far-fetched? Well, all this can become a reality because NASA has already tested the technology that might allow us to travel faster than the speed of light. Let's look at the space fleet people have now. To fly into space, we use conventional rockets carrying tons of fuel and oxygen. These two substances get mixed and ignited. Fire bursts out of the rockets. The exhaust gases move downward, and the rockets move upward, as if pushing off of them. That's how jet propulsion works. This way, we can make the rocket move at almost 5 miles per second. At that speed, you could cross the United States from coast to coast in a mere 8.5 minutes. But if we talk about space, that's very slow. A trip to a neighboring planet, like Mars, takes about 7 months and a trip to the edge of the solar system would take about 35 years. That's how long it took the Voyager space probe, launched in 1977, to get there. But we want to travel between stars and galaxies. And the nearest star, Proxima Centauri, is 4.2 light years away from our home. That would take about 73,000 years to get there. That's longer than intelligent human civilization has even existed. And if you wanted to travel across the whole Milky Way galaxy, which is 100,000 light years wide, it would take you about 1.7 trillion years. By comparison, the entire universe is 14 billion years old. People just travel too slowly. But even at the speed of light, it would still take 4.2 years to travel to the nearest star. And you'd spend 2.5 million years to get to the nearby Andromeda galaxy. But we can't accelerate like this. That's because the laws of physics say that an object with mass can't travel at the speed of light. A photon of light has an infinitely small weight. But if you want to accelerate even a tiny grain of sand to that speed, you'd need an infinite amount of energy. Maybe even more than the entire universe has. But scientists might have found a way around the laws of physics. To create thrust, you need to push off of something. Ships need water. Planes push off of the air. Rockets use the fuel they burn. But this thing, the M-Drive, works in a different way. A powerful magnetron, like the one in your microwave, sends waves into this cone. It's a resonator. It makes the waves inside bounce off of one of the walls and hit the others. As a result, we have a weak force at the narrow end of the cone and a strong force at the wide end. And if we analyze this powerful force, 
we'll see that it is directed toward the wide end of the cone. So, the thrust will be in the opposite direction. Now, let's make this model much, much larger and put the M drive on a spaceship. The narrow end of the cone faces up. The wide end is turned downward. The magnetron starts to work. The resonator creates thrust and the rocket takes off. It makes no noise and doesn't emit any harmful gases at all. This mechanism can accelerate the rocket much faster than we do with tons of fuel. In theory, we could even reach the speed of light. Sounds great, but in reality, it isn't. Although the inventor of this device tried to prove the M-Drive works, no independent experiment around the world has shown positive results. NASA sponsored the construction of such a machine in a laboratory, but it didn't create any thrust during the research. Another option that would allow us to travel much faster than the speed of light is the Alcubi air bubble. A Mexican scientist has figured out a way to use the general theory of relativity without breaking the laws of physics. Let's say we have a spaceship on a space-time blanket, and it needs to make a trip to the other end of the blanket. Instead of just moving from point A to point B hundreds of thousands of light years away, the ship starts pulling the blanket toward itself. As the spacecraft folds the blanket, point B moves toward it. Now the ship needs to travel a much shorter distance to point B. It makes a quick trip and then straightens the time-space blanket back to normal. Voila! So such a spaceship doesn't need powerful engines that will burn tons of fuel and oxygen. It would move in a kind of bubble. But the hardest part is creating such a bubble. To do this, we would need an amount of energy roughly equal to the mass energy of all of Jupiter. That's more than we can produce on Earth. And still, scientists are planning to test this technology on a small space probe the size of Voyager. But this experiment might last for decades or even centuries. Now scientists are trying to reach at least 20% of the speed of light using a laser. And they're planning to get to Proxima Centauri in about 30 years. It's likely to happen like this. A mothership will launch from Earth. It'll carry thousands of fingernail-sized space probes. After reaching orbit, the mothership will launch the probes into space. Each probe will then deploy a sail, a thin, reflective piece of material the size of a parking lot. Then, people will focus a powerful laser beam from Earth directly onto the probe's sails. This will give them an acceleration 1,000 times as strong as the acceleration of free fall on Earth. One by one, the probes will launch and head for their destination. We won't even have to maintain that laser beam all the time. If you turn off the engines of a regular ship on the water, it'll start to lose speed due to friction with the water. But space is an almost perfect vacuum. There's literally nothing there. So there's no friction. All we have to do is accelerate the probes to the needed speed. At 20% of the speed of light, these probes could reach the sun in just 40 minutes. But instead, they will head for the star Proxima Centauri. After about 30 years of travel, four more years will pass before we get a signal from the probes. There are several exoplanets in this system, and some scientists hope to find at least traces of life there. But this sail technology can be used in space even without a powerful laser. We can use the sun. If we create a sail the size of a soccer field and unfold it in space, it'll start catching the sun's rays. And since the surface of the sail is reflective, the rays will bounce off the sail. This will create thrust and propel the spacecraft. One disadvantage of this technology is that we can only use it inside the solar system. In cold interstellar space, the sail won't be able to catch the sun's rays or solar wind. Another candidate for faster than light travel is an ion thruster. Like a conventional rocket, a spacecraft with ion thrusters would be propelled by gas ejected outward. Only in this case, the gas would be ejected not because of fuel combustion, but because of an electric field. We'd need to create a powerful electric field inside the engine. Particles of gas passing through this electric field would get accelerated and ejected outside. This would create thrust. And although the acceleration in such an engine would be many times weaker than in a conventional rocket, the ion engine would be able to reach higher speeds. NASA was planning to build an ion-powered spacecraft to fly to Jupiter. Ion engines consume a lot of energy, so the ship was to be equipped with a nuclear reactor and lots of solar panels. Eight large engines were supposed to accelerate the spacecraft to about 56 miles per second. At this speed, the trip from New York to London would take one minute. 
So far, this technology has been actively tested on different space probes, but it can't provide a solution to how to travel faster than the speed of light. Perhaps people will still be able to travel between galaxies in conventional rockets, but they'll need to use some sort of shortcuts called wormholes. So, back to our space-time blanket. Point A lies at one end, and point B is at the other. Instead of traveling across the entire blanket for millions of years, you can simply fold it. Then point B will be right above point A, and you can quickly get there through a short tunnel between them. Such tunnels are called wormholes. Some scientists believe that wormholes can be inside black holes. But there are two problems here. The nearest black hole is 1,500 light years away. So a trip there would take eons. The second problem is the hole's gravity. Black holes have the strongest gravitational pull of any object in the universe. Their gravity can crush any spacecraft. That's because the gravitational force increases with every inch you move closer to the black hole's center. And the force affecting the nose of the spaceship will be much stronger than the force that affects the tail. The spaceship will stretch out like spaghetti and get torn apart. But there's a theory claiming that a spacecraft or even a person can survive falling into a black hole. But only if the black hole is super massive, like the ones that lie in the centers of galaxies. They can be millions and billions of times heavier than the sun. But even though they're heavier, they're also bigger in size. This means gravity probably doesn't increase so fast there. You or your spacecraft might not turn into spaghetti and might even get to see what's at the heart of the black hole.